So what do these people need to get started? Why aren't they starting? We all know the answer is fear. But the difference with you guys or me or anybody who's followed through is we're more afraid of the, what life would be like if we don't follow through than the person who's willing to settle for what they got and kind of hope it'll change and maybe purchase something for the moment and then not follow through on it. It's almost like people, overachievers, have a little more fear. They're a little more afraid of missing out. They're afraid of not being there or they got a strong enough reason to follow through. So I'd say if you're looking at home, you want to give somebody some value, go, where do I start? I'm sick of this. That's a damn good place. That's probably where they bought the product in the first place, but now to they're not... escape from that for just a minute. What's that? They bought, it, they bought the product to escape from that state. Just, just for a just moment. A minute, yeah. So cause, cause, well, guess what? What makes people excited is progress. You don't have to be at the goal yet to feel alive again. You have to make progress. And the first step to progress and make a decision and buying the product. But then they don't do the second step, right. which is open the damn thing up. I think another powerful distinction that you're hitting on here is the fact that a lot of people that have breakthroughs in their lives, like including Frank and I both in different, you know... Um, success stories, situations, whatever you want to call them, is that, you know, people typically hit rock bottom yeah. before that must is a reality. You're right, you're right. So in thinking of that, you know, because a lot of things as well, like we hear in marketing, you know, like if you had a gun to your head right now and you had to make money in the next, you know, 48 hours, what would you do? And that really resonates with people. But so I just wanted to bring this into the conversation because I think a big part of the market of all these people aren't people that have their backs completely against the wall yet. That's, that's right. Okay, so they're not in a must situation yet. They're in a desire situation where right. they're okay in their lives. They do have big dreams and ambitions. They do want greater things, but it's not pushing them yet to the point where they will do what it takes to master to the something. Must. So, so what do you think? How, how do people go from not having their backs against the wall when they have no choice to say, I'm totally sick of this, right. to, to conditioning their minds to go from their situation where they are, which may be okay, yeah. to getting something greater. Well, think about this. What pisses you off and what excites you is all relative. You know, $300 a week, no, $2,500 excites him more, that memory to this day, than even the million bucks, you know, he did in his you know, first 24-hour version, right? Or you breaking the form in a mile, a million bucks. That must have been out of your mind. Tell me about that for a second. What did that feel like? You make a million bucks in 24 hours, nobody in the history of the internet's done it. Euphoria. Yeah. It's just unbelievable what was your it wasn't even about the money it that's exactly weird. right that's exactly it wasn't right really about the money no it wasn't. I wasn't thinking like oh that's how many cars I can buy or, no I, it just wasn't it was just uh, it was just breaking through like another like barrier of, of, of progress so at that point it wasn't about your back to your wall at that point what it was really it was about a further point for my fear is what it really was for the point for your fear and for some people and I think in some cases it's also a recognition of who I am and what I'm capable of so for somebody whose life is already great this is about, what if I could take on another skill that could create more freedom for my life? And just saying, I'm not having to go out and try and do it all perfectly right now. What I'm gonna do for the next eight weeks, I'm gonna do one, I'm gonna create a little ritual. I'm gonna do one thing a day to condition my mind, right, so that I get strong, so I follow through. I'm gonna read something, I'm gonna listen to something, I'm gonna immerse myself, I'm gonna go for an intense jog, or I'm gonna go lift weights, but I'm gonna do it consciously to get in a state where I'm gonna follow through. That's number one, because people follow through when they're in state. Second, I'm going to get clear about why this is a must for me. Not because my back's against the wall, but because I want to master an area of life that could create some freedom. I'm not going to master it overnight, but I got the system, I got the plan. I'm going to do one thing a day. I'm going to work on one subject a week. This week's going to be about figuring out what the right product or industry is. Next week's going to be basics of building traffic. And each week, I'm going to make a little progress, and I'm going to get to a goal, whatever that is. I'm going to make 1000 bucks, my 300 bucks in a week. I'm going to get to my 2500 That first 2500 is the most excited. Unbelievable. The first $300. I remember it's the most life-changing, to, too. It is the most life-changing. I remember I was supposed to be a truck driver making 24000 a year because I'd be making the most anybody in my family had ever made. How'd that work out for you? Yeah, very, real well. Thank God I'm not driving a truck, right? I think you could so pull I, the truck. Probably. I figured I, out, I could pull it with my finger, man. Yeah. I could do it with my teeth. I could pull yeah. it with my teeth, right? Thirty-six grand a year was the goal. If I could make three grand in a month, when I did that, was out of my mind. And then it was like, could I make 10 grand a month? Then it was 10 grand in a day, then 100 grand a day. Then could I make a million dollars in a day? I had a day where I made $400 million in a day. The stock value of the company I took public, my personal stock. But it was the probably after I did it, though, so it doesn't really count. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> You're right. People don't remember who's first, Tony. <laughs> 400 totally million, a million? Yeah, who cares? Who cares? No, I'm, just, I'm not saying that's it's That's amazing, though. I'm not saying no, no, brag. No, of course. It's because they told me when I was on stage, I had this audience of about 15,000 people at the Continental Center. It was during a stretch break. I was doing what I loved, rocking the house. Everybody's going crazy. And they go, the stock's worth 400 million bucks right now. I was like, wow, that's cool. It's like, 
okay, that's, I don't want to sound stupid, it's like, what's next? And I went right back to what I loved. Once you break through, then it just becomes a game. The people that are getting your products have not yet broken through in most cases. The breakthrough happens by conditioning your mind every day, by feeding it a role model or story. It's putting yourself in a peak state where you follow through by getting physically strong. It's creating a little ritual of doing a little bit each day, and then you get momentum. But the most important thing of all is what we start out with. Why? Absolutely. Why is it a must for you? It doesn't have to be you're against the wall, but it has to be something you're hungry for, because the only difference in people is hunger. And if you're not hungry, get around people that are hungry and something will hit you. You watch a conversation, you get around people that are doing better, and all of a sudden you start going, uh, my life sucks. I remember I went to a guy in, in L.A., he's one of the most multi-billionaire guys, I'll never forget, and I lived in the Del Mar Castle, and I was really proud. That was like the symbol of me having taken myself from being poor to providing for my family this great place. It's built from castles in Europe overlooking the ocean not far from you. And I went to this guy's house. He's a billionaire. And he took me down to his wine cellar. I don't even drink wine. I went through this whole thing. At the end of the night, I was depressed. I lived in a Del Mar tenement, as far as I was concerned. I really was. I was like, I live in a crappy place, and, and all my standards changed. All of a sudden, I wasn't willing to settle for living that. All of a sudden, my back was to the wall in a different way, because as a man, I knew I was capable of more. So people can change their standard by getting around where it's better. People can change their standard by getting associated with what's true, like the bills they got to solve, the problems they got to do it. Or they can do it because they're excited because it's something new they want to take on. Everyone's different, but they got to find the why and they got to come up with some daily rituals to get them going and just do a step at a time. That's where you get momentum. Awesome. That is awesome. So, you know, think about it. what's the holy grail between somebody taking action or not? It's one word, certainty. When somebody is absolutely certain, they, you know, the common word is believe, right? But you, know, you can believe at a general level or you can believe with certain. When you're absolutely certain that if I do this, it's going to get that result and that result's going to change my life, you'll do it. When you think it absolutely is not going to work, you're never going to do it. The middle no man's land of maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, that's the piece that kills people, right? So if it's a must for you, you got to make it work, right? In our case, right? That's an example. If it's not a must for you and you're not sure, you don't know what to do. So I, years ago, I'd look around and say, okay, how do people get themselves to follow through they haven't been following through? What's the difference? And I started interviewing hundreds of people, literally, and eventually thousands, because I had thousands of my events. So I'd ask the group to give me their feedback. And I came up with this model. It's like the holy grail of belief or the holy grail of momentum. It's like the difference between what makes the rich get richer and the poor get poor, right? And the difference we all know is mindset, but like, how is that built? So this is what I did. I created stupid little four little boxes, and I'll scribble it here for you. You think about the first thing that determines whether you can do something or not, and I put that in this first box at the top here on the left side, and it's potential. Like, what's the potential of a human being? Like, when you guys started, you proved something no one had done in history. You ran the four-minute mile, right? For golly knows how many centuries, they're trying to run a four-minute mile. Roger Bannister does it. How did he do it? Do you remember? You did it in this industry, right? You made a million bucks in a day. No one had ever done that in history, right? After you did it, a bunch of other guys are doing it because it became possible. Roger Bannister didn't just go physically practice. He made a shift in his head. He practiced in his head because he could never achieve it physically, so he had a change in his head first so that the result became certain enough he believed it, and then his body got him through. After Roger Bannister ran that four-minute mile, within two years, 37 people ran a four-minute mile. Well, when no one in history had ever done it. Now, here's how it works. The potential for anybody getting your product is extraordinary. They could do what you've done as much, more, or less. They can do whatever they want to do. The potential's there. The market's proven that. Whether or not they tap into potential has a lot to do with what action they take, which is the question you came to me with, right? Like, you know, God, they all have potential, but they're not taking action. And we all know that the action they take is going to determine the results they get. That's pretty obvious. So most people have a belief about what their real potential is no matter what you tell them. And that affects how much action they take. And of course that affects the result. And then ironically, that result reinforces their belief. And then that belief affects it. So I'll give you an example. Let's say a person has unlimited potential, we all agree. But they take little action, little results. Why? Because they have to start with a problem with their belief. They don't believe it's really going to happen for me. Maybe for Frank Kearns because he's got the cool hair and stuff. Or maybe it's for you because you're so driven, but it's not me. Maybe Tony Robbins because he's a freak, got these big teeth. Whatever their thought process is, right? They got this thing, right? But what happens is if you believe that there's very little potential, how much action are you going to take? Nothing. Nothing, little. And when you take little potential with a little action, what kind of results do you get? 
lousy little results. And when you get little results, what does that do to your belief? You go, see, I told you this was a waste of time, sold you this wouldn't work. And then what happens, you tap even less potential, you take even less action, you get even worse results and your belief gets even weaker. And this sucker feeds on itself until you are in the downward spiral. It's poisonous. It's poisonous and it's self-fulfilling. Now, what if something could happen that could come along and fill you with a sense of absolute certainty? Not like, I believe, but mean, where you know. In you guys' case, mine as well, we knew because we had to. Because we burned the boats. There was no other option. We had to find a way. We, had, we weren't going to live that way. We all did it in different ways and for different reasons, but in essence, that was it. If you get yourself in a state of certainty that this is going to work, I'm going to find the way, and if this doesn't work, I will make the way, then you tap a lot more potential. And when you're certain in your potential, you take massive action. When you take massive action, you really believe in something, you get great results. When you get great results, your brain goes, see, I told you I was a stud. <laughs> I told you this thing would work out. Now you're even stronger. You tap more potential, take greater action, greater results. That's how you went from 300 bucks in a week to 2,500 in five days, to 100,000 in a month, to a million bucks in a day. Same thing with you. And we get momentum. That's why the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Now, some people go out and they go, well, I'm gonna take a bunch of action, all right? I'm gonna open this product, I'm gonna try it. And they'll say to you, I even did it. But it's like a salesman who goes and knocks on the door and he knocks on 100 doors and says, You don't want one of these, do you? Yeah, exactly right. You know? <laughs> and even if he doesn't say it verbally, his face says it because he doesn't believe it's gonna work. So his voice, his body, the execution is so weak. Maybe if he talks to 100 people, somebody's gonna buy out of pity. <laughs> they don't want his kids to starve, right? But he's not gonna get the result. So the core difference in people is how do you produce certainty when the world isn't giving it to you? You go out and you try and you try in your case, you're 100,000 in debt and nothing's working. How do you keep yourself going? The way you did it, the way I did it, the way you're doing it, we may not have done it consciously, is we didn't change our potential, that was there. And it wasn't even taking more action. Taking more action with a belief it's not gonna work, it's not gonna change anything. We got results in our head that made us feel certain as if it had already happened. True or false for you? True. Right, so give me an example so people know I'm not just making this crap up. Well, I mean, just like when I had nothing, I already knew I was driving like Ferraris and Porsches and stuff because I always wanted those cars. I al already knew I was going to have them. It was inevitable. Right. I inevitably, you know, that was just my inevitable outcome. But how did you do that? Did you have a ritual? Did you think about it regularly? Was it one time you thought about it or was it something you had an obsession towards? I had an obsession towards it. I mean, yeah. I used to go, I used to work at a video store, which is the last job I ever had in my life. Thank God. And uh, I used to go to, to work almost every day and I used to bring two magazines with me to read on my breaks. Entrepreneur magazine just to read about business and everything yeah. else to read about what other people are doing look for role models And I used to carry an auto trader with me and wow. I used to look at Porsches that were for sale Yeah, and people always used to ask me. What are you doing with that auto trader magazine? I'm like, well, I'm just picking out the Porsche that I'm gonna buy right when I'm which probably got you a lot of crap <laughs> I, I, I did I, people made fun of me. I, sure. I actually had a boss at that job tell me, you know you really shouldn't do that to yourself John because it's, it's very, very likely that that is never going to happen. That it's very likely that you, you're never going to have that car. Yeah. That's, that's the kind of belief he was trying to put in my head. And I was like, no, you don't realize that it's, it's inevitable right. that I will drive here at sometime in the near future with that car when I'm not working for you right. and drop movies off for you to put back on the shelf. And was that it? actually happened. And it was one of the most oh, fulfilling days of my entire life. And the great thing was when I pulled up in this car, I was, well, you know, I was in my mid twenties. Yeah. A car that most mid twenty. What you kind know, of car was it? It was a Porsche 911 Turbo. It was sure. a convertible and everything. Sure. It was a beautiful car. It was one I, one out. Yeah. One I always dreamed of having. But you know, for a few years now, I always circled the ads of which ones I was going to buy. Well, when I finally got it and I pulled up at the store, you know, I had all these people. Some people that were still working at the seven dollar an hour job were there years after I left. And I'll never forget this, even the boss and stuff, and, and the reaction of the people was like, wow, that is awesome. Yeah. Is that your dad's car? <laughs> and all I said to them was, not exactly. Good for and you. And I just smiled and just left. But it was, you know, I just, I, I, it's the weirdest thing, but I just knew it was going to happen. But you knew it because I you I conditioned did, myself you to could, You did it over and over again. Was, yeah. When I was in high school, I was not a popular kid, but I was passionate and intense, and I'll never forget. Some people, had given, some particular girls gave me some crap, and a guy too. And I wrote in their journals or their, you know, their annual yearbook at the end, I wrote, you know, someday, I said, you treated me like hell. Someday, I'll be rich and famous, and you'll be an effing truck driver. And you'll be sitting there, I'll be with my rich, I'll be with this beautiful woman in my life, rich, and you'll be watching me on television thinking, you wish you would have treated me better. I actually wrote this shit in people's <laughs> annuals, because I went to a 10-year high school reunion, <laughs> and the people <laughs> showed me this That's stuff, great. right? 
But it's like, I burned the bridges, baby. I was like, there, this is how it's going to be. So I'll give you a perfect example of this. You know, they did studies, many have been done at this element, where they want to say, how much does the mind affect performance? So take basketball. I've worked with a lot of NBA players and turned them around. And one of the problems many of them have is they'll choke on the free throw line. You know, well, everybody knows in that case, if you normally shoot really well and now you're not, something's interfering. Something's getting in front of your state. Some uncertainty, right? Obviously. So they take a group and say, we're going to make them better. How do you make somebody better who's got this mental block? So they take a group of guys and they're going to do free throws and they do one group where they just practice for six weeks. Totally intense practice and I forget the number of free throws, but they got to do this many free throws every day. Take a second group and they have them not practice at all. Obvious. And they take a third group and they don't let them touch a basketball. All they do is have them practice in their mind, but the key is it's not practice makes perfect. It's perfect practice makes perfect, as corny as that sounds. So these guys see themselves making the shot every single time, conditioning their mind and body that it's perfect every time. They're not interrupted by a reality that would screw with them. So at the end of six weeks, they tally it up, and now they give them a test to see who has the highest free throw percentage you know, success. And what do you guess it's going to be? Well, the obvious person says, obviously, it's not the guys that didn't practice, but which one is it, the mind or is it the ones that actually practice? I'm assuming the mind. Yeah, you would assume it because it's true. Right. You intuitively know the truth, that practicing's not enough. It's getting yourself so certain so many times that now when you go to do it, there's no hesitancy and you execute. It's having that absolute certainty that makes you tap your full potential, take massive action, get massive results, be reinforced to have even stronger belief. This is what makes somebody a star at anything.